This Today. conference will now be recorded. Yeah, okay. So my grand idea was to try to cover all of breast cancer in one lecture, and then I kind of realized that that was probably too ambitious. So um, I'm just going to do essentially up to and through DCIS today, and then we'll do invasive cancer next week um, since we have time, and uh, it's a big topic. So uh, the first thing I want to start with is kind of I think this is a framework that you should use when you're thinking about breast cancer. Um, you should basically uh, basically think of all the breast things that you'll see along the spectrum, and that'll help you kind of frame in your mind what you need to do for them. So on the far left is kind of other high-risk lesions, so we'll talk about a couple of those, and you can lump all those together. And then atypia, meaning aductal hyper, atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, LCIS, and then DCIS, and then invasive cancer. And I'll kind of go over each one of those in turn and, and talk about where you can draw some lines in your head um, about where to separate things. So the first thing we'll talk about is other high-risk lesions. Uh, let's try to make this a little more interactive. Um, so, Sheckman, why don't you talk to me about high-risk lesions that you're aware of and what you do for those? So, you have, like, radial scar. Uh, okay. It's not cancer, but it looks very similar on imaging. So, it's hard to have, uh, you know, it's concordant with uh, your biopsy. Um, so for that, you need to excise it because there's a chance of upstaging to cancer or DCIS. Okay. Any other high-risk lesion you can think of? Uh, that's the one that comes to mind. Beth, what's the most common cause of uh, bloody nipple discharge? Introductal papilloma. Perfect. How do we treat an introductal papilloma? Um, there, I don't, there's nothing to do for the lesion, but if there's a question about it, you need an excisional biopsy to rule out carcinoma. I okay, believe. how would there be a question about it? Um, I think if you have any concerning features on biopsy, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I know that the management is typically nothing. Yeah, I would not say that. So, okay. you know, some of this comes down, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we go, but some of this comes down to, um, like, the morbidity of your uh, diagnostic and or therapeutic uh, intervention. So, like, we talked about MSLT2 and we talked about melanoma, right? So, mm -hmm. the the lymphadenectomy doesn't change melanoma-specific survival, so we don't do it. But that's because lymphadenectomy is morbid. An excisional mm. biopsy of the breast, or even a lumpectomy, is not morbid. So our threshold to do these things is going to be way lower in the breast than, you know, doing a pancreatic operation or, uh, you know, or even a lymphadenectomy. So, you know, a lot of this comes down to patient preference, their anxiety, and okay. as most of you have probably experienced at this point, the level of ang patient anxiety around all things breast is very high. So uh, we can get into it, but I would say like for the chiefs who are about to take their oral boards, just err on the side of excisional biopsy for all these things, but we'll talk about why you often don't need them. So introductal papilloma. So this is like the easy way to think of it is it's like a polyp in the duct of a breast. So it's this little uh, fibrovas fibrovascular core that sticks out into the duct. And then the, it's kind of like a polyp, so the tip of it can kind of uh, flake off or necrose, and then you can have some bloody discharge or tan or serous discharge. So again, this is a very common abscite question. Most common cause of bloody nipple discharge is is a uh, introductory papilloma. Can also cause clear discharge, things like that. So the way you work it up, image. So when would you, uh, Johnny, when would you do a ductogram? Have you ever seen one and why does it matter? Have you ever done a ductogram before? No. Yeah, uh, most people haven't. I, I, I mean, we've heard it talk about it before. Um, I think you do a ductogram, I mean, you do it to, to locate the lesion, to know where you're gonna incise. Yeah, so if you, if you do an ultrasound, 
ultrasound, if there's nipple discharge, you do an ultrasound and there's nothing there that you can see. So the options would be ultrasound, you see intraducal papillomas. We'll talk about that in a second. If you don't see anything on ultrasound, but you have clear discharge coming from one duct, you can actually put a small catheter into that duct and then squirt contrast in, and then they just do like fluoro images and they can give you a ductogram and they may see a mass in the duct that you can't see on ultrasound. I, you know, I think I've used it once ever. It's not like a super common thing, but it is an option. And then if, let's say you saw a lesion on a uh, ductogram, you, the patient had continuous bloody nipple discharge that was annoying them and they wanted something done, but you can't otherwise localize the mass. What could you do uh, to get that out? I think you're getting at, you need a central duct excision. Yeah, exactly. What is that? What's a central duct excision? You take out all the ductal tissue immediately below the areola. Okay. Any idea how you would do that? Uh, I, so I think I, I actually have seen this once. Uh, we made a, um, so we cannulated the duct with a, uh, a lacrimal duct probe and then made a, um, like a curvilinear incision around the areola and then dissected out, uh, uh, I think we actually selectively took that duct, but uh, I, I guess you would just take all the ductal tissue below the uh, below the area. Yeah. Of that. Okay. Yeah, it kind of depends on what your goal is. If you're trying to do a uh, a major duct excision where you're trying to take basically all the ducts, then yeah, you just take out the tissue below the areola. If you're trying to be more selective, you can either. So I think. Um, you can either leave the probe in. Uh, uh, you can either leave the probe in and just take that duct out, or some people describe putting methylene blue into the duct, and then you just kind of take everything that's stained blue out. Uh, so that's another kind of potential oral board scenario that comes up uh, for persistent uh, nipple discharge. So anyway, you see a, a papillary lesion, let's say we see it on ultrasound, then you do a core needle, and Beth, this is what you're getting at. So how do you treat it? In general, I would say excise is kind of the answer especially for tests. So on the ab site, you're gonna choose excision. Um, but with high quality, so this is older data that the, the upgrade uh, number, which means finding something more than just intraductal papilloma, atypia or invasive cancer was a little less than 10%. But with better cores, so now we take larger cores than we used to, we have better imaging, et cetera. So now we can differentiate, is this an intraductal papilloma with atypia or without atypia? With atypia, you should definitely excise. Uh, but without atypia, if you have good imaging concordance, they think they got a good biopsy. Maybe you do a repeat ultrasound after the biopsy and the papilloma is gone. They feel like they got the whole thing. Uh, and there's no atypia, then the, re the most recent papers on this say that the upgrade rate is more like 2%, 0 to 2%. There are two papers out that have basically said there was no upgrades if you have good concordance and a good biopsy. So you can discuss with the patient and potentially follow those. I will tell you in my experience that every patient with one of these wants it out. So you usually just take it out. But uh, there is data now for following that. So again, the test questions are gonna be behind the data. So on the test, just answer excision in real life. You can talk about watching it. All right, radial scar, it's basically the same thing. So these are uh, central cellular, whatever. This is the pathologic description. It's basically just a dense scar that's surrounded by epithelial pro proliferation. But to what uh, Shekman said, it looks like a cancer on imaging. So it looks like a cancer. The issues with that are that there can be a malignancy if you do a biopsy, an excisional biopsy, in up to 40%. It's not that there's a, necessarily a uh, malignancy inside the mass but just that it distorts the architecture and hides other cancers. So some reports, again, up to 40%. So that's why a lot of people say just excise these to be safe. There are reports just like, it's just like uh, intraductal papilloma now where the old reports say that the upgrade rate or finding a cancer was around 10%. Now with good biopsies, good imaging, good concordance, there are reports that say there's no cancers found in these. But again, if you see any atypia, the upgrade rate is much higher. So you got to take it out. So now what I would say is that, yeah, yeah. Can you explain the nuance between the difference of a surrounding malignancy of three to 40% and the upgrade rate? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's hard to, cause it's, this is like, you know, who writes a paper on, on this, you know, it's like these single institution reports. Uh, we look back at a hundred patients with 
radial scar on imaging. And, you know, some papers say, these are from review papers, basically a lot of these stats. So some papers will say, well, we excised all of them and we found malignancy in 40%. So is that a surrounding malignancy or a malignancy within? I would say it's almost always a surrounding malignancy, but that's probably hard to break down when you're doing a retrospective review of your institutional data. So, you know, the bottom line is that these look like malignancies, they can hide malignancies. However, they can also have atypia within the scar tissue. So that scar, that dense scar tissue in the center could, you know, trigger a malignancy too, right? So the inflammation there could trigger malignancy. So you can see atypia within the scar and that can have an upgrade rate of, you know, again, from, this is like from one paper, 26%. So these numbers are not hard and fast. I wouldn't like, these aren't 4,000 patient prospective trials, right? So these are just sort of single institution, get you some idea of what the numbers are. So the bottom line is that if you're counseling a patient and you have no information except what you see on imaging, then you have to say this could very well be a malignancy. If you have a bunch of good cores and good radiologic concordance, then you can trust that biopsy a little bit more. And if there's no atypia there, you can probably watch it. Again, just like intraductal papilloma, most patients don't want to do that. They want it out. And again, the morbidity of an excisional biopsy of the breast is very low. So most of the time you're going to excise these. Now, if you have an 80 year old patient with a radial scar, you can probably leave that alone. Okay. So uh, kind of boiling this down, other high risk lesions, probably going to do an excisional biopsy. There's some data for observing these things, but uh, on your app side, on your boards, I would just do an excisional biopsy to be safe. You can talk about, you know, if you have good concordance with no atypia, there's potential to observe, but probably just take it out. All right, so now next up on the spectrum, we're going to talk about atypia. So uh, I think Bobby was on. Did he leave yes. us? Yes, no, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Uh, okay, Bobby, how do you manage atypical ductal hyperplasia or atypical lobular hyperplasia? Uh, generally with an excisional biopsy. Um, okay, again, good. So, so the semantics are important here. What is it? What is the difference between an excisional biopsy and a lumpectomy? Um, <clears throat> You don't necessarily need negative margins for the typical um, for the excisional biopsy, whereas for a lumpectomy, you need negative margins. Perfect. Yeah. So you take these things out. Why are you taking them out? Because of the um, concordance, the associated sort of malignancy, uh, the upgrade rate of good. Uh, greater than ten percent. Yeah. Good. So the upgrade rate is probably somewhere around twenty percent. And that's an easy number to remember for all these things. So ADH is going to be actually be DCIS 20% of the time. DCIS is actually going to be cancer 20% of the time, roughly. Again, rough numbers. But so, you know, you can tell your patient when you go to the OR that there's, you know, somewhere between a 15, 20% chance that we're actually going to find something more when we go. So that's why we need to go take this out. But to your point, that's exactly right. You don't need margins. So we don't care about margins here. That's why it's called an excisional biopsy, because it really is just a biopsy. You're trying to get a good sample of the tissue in that area. But if you, you know, if they say, well, there's ADH at the margin, you don't care. You just move on. What else do you need to do after you get an ADH biopsy? Are they done? You get your ADH and then nothing more? Um, Kai? Sorry, what was it? Ty is was our it? local breast cancer expert. Uh -huh. um, so what was the question? Sorry. So if you get ADH on an excisional biopsy, are you done or do you have to do anything afterwards? Is there any treatment that the patient needs afterwards? I, um, I think you can give them hormonal treatment. Okay, um, good. Any oh, idea what that's based on? No, I don't okay. remember the study. So yeah, so we'll go over it, but the the key term is risk reduction therapy, okay? So that could mean hormonal therapy. That could, in the extreme cases, also mean mastectomy. So risk reduction therapy is the key term there because it's not necessarily hormone therapy. It could be other things. So again, upgrade rate 15 to 
you have to excise it given that risk of upgrade. You don't have to worry about margins. Relative risk of cancer to a patient without AD, atypia is almost four times. So these women are at a, uh, you know, at a significantly increased risk to the general population. Um, and this is from, there was a big paper that looked at uh, it's sort of an interesting paper. They looked at the number of foci on the excisional biopsy of atypia. So what they found is that if you have more than one foci, it actually goes up dramatically. So women who have three foci of atypia within one excisional biopsy essentially have the same risk as women with DCIS. So um, that is something to look for when you take ADH out. It's not all ADH is not created equal. If you have extensive ADH throughout and the, you know, the pathologist will talk to you about the fine lines between DCIS and extensive ADH, probably almost the same thing. But if you have multiple foci of ADH, your risk goes up. Same is true of ALH. So anytime you have multiple risk of a, or multiple foci of atypia, you got to worry a little bit more about those patients. So these are their, you know, increased, their relative risk to a patient without atypia. So again, three foci of, uh, of ADH is, is nine times the average risk, which is probably on, on the order of uh, high-grade DCIS. All right, uh, so I put this, are you guys aware of the Gale risk model? Yeah, it looks, some heads are shaking, good. So there's a online calculator, it's like, uh, I just Google it every time, I think it's like breastcancerrisk.com or something like that. So there's an online calculator, you can put in the patient's factors uh, and you'll, it'll spit out a risk, a five-year risk of breast cancer. And one of the things in that is a biopsy with atypia. So just to, you know, I just put in nothing high risk except one biopsy with atypia. And so 2.5% five-year risk of developing cancer. The reason that this number is so important is the study that they did uh, to look at hormonal therapy for prevention of development of breast cancer, which is called NSAVP P1, and we'll go over that trial. Uh, have any, do any of you have any idea what the threshold to get into that trial was, what your five-year risk needed to be? Anybody going to give me a yes? I see a frowny face. I see some no's. All right, so 1.66%, so not very high. So if you have a five-year breast cancer risk of 1.66%, then you uh, qualified for the trial of uh, preventive tamoxifen. So ADH, just ADH, nothing else puts you over that line uh, and you should be offered risk reduction therapy. So again, treating treatment for atypia, excisional biopsy plus risk reduction. Do we care about margins? Kai says no, correct. No, we do not care about margins for atypia. All right, LCIS. Who's next? Uh, let's see. Christina, do you want to tell us about LCIS? Oh, I know LCIS in and itself is LCIS? not. Um, I think we used to do mastectomies, but now we offer like lifetime surveillance of bilateral breasts. And, um, I think we can do prophylactic mastectomy. Okay, so this is kind of the, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk, not just on cancer, but on, on pre-malignant things, because there's a lot of confusion and the, the wording is important here, right? So LCIS, first thing we're going to do is, are we going to take it out or leave it alone? The LCIS itself. I think we just, we don't have to, no, we don't take it out. So you have to do an excisional biopsy. Well, okay. And again, why are we doing an excisional biopsy? In case of upstaging. Yeah. So there's a risk of upgrade. So we have to do an excisional biopsy. It may harbor a, an invasive cancer. Um, the so one big difference between LCIS and DCIS is LCIS considered a pre-malignant lesion. No. But DCIS. Oh, right. So DCIS this is. A lot of, yeah, good. Good. So DCIS, if you leave it alone, the actual DCIS will probably turn into cancer. If you leave LCIS alone, that exact lesion will probably not turn into cancer, but it uh, represents a field defect is kind of the way we think of it. So uh, that woman's breast is at increased risk of, of cancer, but not in that exact spot. 
And to your point about contralateral, the contralateral breast is also at increased risk. So we'll talk about that with some data. Um, but we have to excise it. And then what do we do in, additional, in addition to an excisional biopsy? What do we need to offer? Um, we can, I guess, do the hormone testing. And if they're hormone positive, get hormone therapy. So that is for DCIS. So we're going we're gonna to draw a big line in this chart between LCIS and DCIS. And I want you guys to get that line in your head. LCIS and atypia are not premalignant lesions. They are just markers of risk. Uh, you have to do an excisional biopsy, and then you offer, what did we offer atypia besides this excisional biopsy? Risk reduction. Risk reduction therapy, good. So risk reduction. So to your point, risk reduction could mean bilateral mastectomy. So if you have a 35-year-old with LCIS and a fam strong family history, you may offer bilateral mastectomy to that patient. But I don't want you to get in your head that like LCIS means bilateral mastectomy. That's not at all how breast cancer works. So much of it, especially in these pre-malignant lesions, is about patient preference and their specific factors. So you can't treat everyone with LCIS the same. An 80-year-old woman with LCIS is not the same as a 40-year-old with four family members with breast cancer. So it's not just the pathology, it's the whole situation. But the pathology tells you excisional biopsy plus risk reduction, okay? So... Uh, Okay, so this is a big longitudinal study. Sorry, it's a little too high. You may not, hopefully you can see the top. So 29 year longitudinal experience evaluating uh, essentially uh, looking at LCIS. So the 10 year risk of developing a, an invasive cancer with LCIS, any idea what that number would be? Let's go Sheckman or Bobby, somebody in the mid-level years. If you have LCIS, what's your risk of cancer? Over, over the next ten years. Is it ten percent? Twenty. So it's twice that. So it's pretty high. Twenty percent. So what do we do to reduce that? Chemo prevention, right? So yeah. So what what does chemo prevention mean, Bobby? Uh, usually hormonal therapy. With what? Uh, tamoxifen or an astrazole. Okay, and how do you decide which one? Uh, whether they're uh, menopausal, premenopausal or postmenopausal. Good, yeah, so that's exactly right. So this is just uh, the KM of um, developing a invasive cancer. So you see with no chemo prevention, and you know these flat lines at the end are probably due to poor follow-up, but it, with no chemo prevention, that, that number accrues pretty quickly. One thing about breast cancer, especially these pre-malignant lesions, the, you have to look at the x-axis. So this is over 15 to 30 years, right? So at 10 years, the risk is 21%. You know, at 15, it probably gets down, it probably gets closer to 30. So there is a real risk. But again, if you're 80 years old, your 30-year risk is not overly important if you have a bunch of comorbidities, et cetera. But, you know, when we think about chemo prevention, we're talking usually about women in their 40s to 60s, younger women who we want to treat more aggressively. So we can significantly reduce their risk with chemo prevention. And then this is, Christina, you Wait, brought so this up about- Wait, so Dr. Braylon? Yeah. Oh, maybe you're about to say that. But so, cause Christina just said tamoxifen, like chemo prevention for LCIS, and you were like, no risk reduction, but that tamoxifen is part of risk reduction, right? Yeah, risk reduction means either hormonal therapy or mastectomy, but that's, okay. you know, I, you guys, Sometimes you guys get locked into like, this gets a mastectomy, this gets that. It, it, no, risk yeah, but she, therapy okay. is a good term because it encompasses all those things. And it, right. it, a lot of it comes down to the patient's preference, right? Okay. And there are specific factors. But risk reduction therapy means either chemo prevention or risk reduction surgery, which is a mastectomy. Now, to, your, to Christina's point about bilateral, so two thirds of these cancers when they come are ipsilateral and one third are bilateral. So they are at risk for bilateral cancels, cancers. I think when I was a resident that I, I learned that the risk was equal uh, ipsilateral and contralateral, that's not exactly true, right? So the, the risk of ipsilateral cancer is higher, but it, the, there's risk for both sides. And then Meg, since you, since you chimed in, what kind of cancers do these women get when they get cancer? They get lobular or ductal? Ductal. 
So sort of. So they get both, right? So, but just don't think that it's only lobular. So these are the, in this particular paper, about a third got BCIS. So another, you know, pre-malignant lesion, not a true invasive cancer. Of the invasive cancers, it was half and half. So I learned that it was ductal too when I was a resident, but that's not actually what the data shows. So maybe if you include DCIS in ductal, then they more commonly get ductal. But the bottom line is that LCIS is a marker of risk. It doesn't turn into a lobular cancer. It's not a pre-malignant lesion. So, um, you know, again, about twice as many will uh, be invasive uh, and twice as many will be ipsilateral, but you are at risk for uh, bilateral cancer. So you, you want to treat the whole body or you want to do a bilateral mastectomy if you want to reduce the risk with surgery. So this is a big trial that you guys should be aware of, P1 for prevention one, right? So inclusion criteria were women. This is an interesting trial. Any woman over 60 could be enrolled. Um, any woman under 60 with a five-year uh, predicted risk of 1.66%, so not very high. So this was a low threshold to get into this trial. Anyone with history of LCIS. So essentially, if you, when you think about this in your head, it should be any woman with a strong family history, any woman with atypia or LCIS. Those are the women that we're talking about here. So they enrolled it. This is the good thing about breast cancer is that there's these huge trials that enrolled a ton of people and they're very well-designed trials. So simple trial, they enrolled a whole bunch of people, gave half of them tamoxifen, half of them placebo, and this is the overall rates of invasive, sorry, this slide came out kind of weird. Overall rates of invasive and non-invasive cancers. So over time, again, this is over five years, so not a terribly long time. And you know, close to 40% of the women developed cancers in those five years. So these are high risk women, but uh, the risk for them was real and the risk was reduced by about 50% uh, with tamoxifen. So, Tamoxifen for high-risk women works well, reduces their risk of developing invasive cancer by about half, also their risk of a non-invasive cancer by about half. So then we can look at some subgroups. So this is atypical hyperplasia, so it includes aductal and, uh, atypical ductal and atypical lobular. So this is kind of the number you need to look at right here. So uh, if, you, if you, sorry, this one, if you had uh, atypia, your risk of developing an invasive cancer was decreased by 86% with tamoxifen. So that's pretty dramatic. So if you have, that should say ADH and ALH, sorry. But if you have atypia, your risk of developing cancer is decreased by 86%. Now your risk of developing cancer, if you only have one foci of atypia and you're 70 years old, pretty low. So maybe that patient doesn't need risk reduction, but a 40 year old, with atypical ductal hyperplasia, especially if they have multi, multiple foci, again, their risk is, you know, between four and eight times the average woman. And that over the next 40 years is pretty darn high. So those women should be offered risk reduction therapy for sure. Uh, and then looking at LCIS. So again, if you have LCIS, that's the bottom number here, risk ratio 44 or 0.44. So that means uh, they reduce the risk by 56%. So any woman who you see, you do an excisional biopsy, they have atypia or LCIS, they should be offered tamoxifen. Okay, that's the take home. So what kind of cancers does this work for? What do you think? It's tamoxifen, right? So it works for ER positive cancer. So the this is looking at all the patients that had invasive cancers. And if they were hormone negative cancers, the tamoxifen basically did nothing. If they were hormone positive cancers, the tamoxifen reduced the risk dramatically. So it only really works on hormone positive. How do you know what kind of cancer a woman's going to develop? You really don't, right? But um, like a woman with BRCA1 is much more likely to develop a ER negative cancer. And so tamoxifen is not really going to help them. But your average risk 50-year-old with atypia or LCIS, they're you know more likely to develop an ER positive cancer, so tamoxifen will work well for them. All right, and then uh, what about side effects? So Shekman, what are the side effects of tamoxifen? Mm -hmm. Like menopausal symptoms, and then there's always the worry of endometrial carcinoma. Okay, good. So this graph is the rate of uh, invasive endometrial carcinomas over time. The, this is per 1,000, keep that in mind. 
So the risk is actually pretty low, but it is dramatically increased with tamoxifen. What other risks are there? Shekman, not just endometrial cancer, but? Uh, you can get, oh, I don't remember. What if the woman is 35 and she smokes? Or whatever age and smokes, let's put it that way. What is, on the app site, a 35-year-old woman who smokes and is on oral contraceptive pills is going to have what? Blood clots. Yeah, so blood clots. So any hormonal therapy puts you at slightly increased risk for blood clots. So uh, so this is just PEs, just to highlight one. But uh, so over 50, it, this is, again, per 1,000. So this is not a common complication, but the risk ratio is, is 3x with tamoxifen. So you have to keep in mind that there are side effects to these drugs, but they're not common. So increased rate of complications, but you know again, it's one versus 0.5% uh, risk of endometrial cancer at five years, and these very, very low rates of thromboembolic events, but it does put you at slightly increased risk for that. Okay, so take-homes from P1, patients that are at high risk, so LCIS, calculated risk greater than 1.66%, you can use that Gale model, like if a patient has a, a couple family members, you can plug their info into that Gale model and come out with a five-year risk. If it's greater than 1.66%, you can offer them risk reduction therapy, decreases the risk of invasive and DCIS by roughly 50%. For ADH, it's 86%. For LCIS, 56%. Um, it only decreases really ER positive cancers. Uh, and then there's increased risk of the complications, but the rates are low. Okay, questions about P1? Dr. Breland, I asked this in the chat, but um, with the knowledge that we're not sure what hormone status cancer they're going to manifest in the future, do we offer tamoxifen for all women or just those with ER positive pre-malignant lesions? So what, what lesions do we test for ER positive? Or what, you know, what lesions do we actually do ER staining on? Um, I only thought I'll that you did. I'll answer your question with a biopsy. question. <laughs> so it's Why not any questions? biopsy. Okay. It's not any biopsy. You ask questions to learn, Beth. That's why we're here. Uh, Bobby, do you know what things we actually test for ER? Is it uh, DCIS and uh, invasive ductal carcinoma? Yeah. So basically DCIS and up. So we only actually test DCIS and invasive cancers for ER. So when we get ADH, LCIS, we don't actually know. And, you know, I mean, that it's an interesting question that nobody's ever studied because people think that, again, these aren't pre-malignant lesions. They're, they're markers of increased risk. So the LCIS that you excise does not become the cancer. So would the LCIS being ER positive predict their future cancer being ER positive? Nobody knows, but we don't think so. So we just offer it based on their increased risk, not based on that specific lesion, okay? So anybody with those high-risk lesions should be offered risk reduction therapy. Thank you, sir. Okay, excisional biopsy plus risk reduction therapy for LCIS, that's the take home. All right, so we've covered P1, everybody's good on that. Meg, you're good, you ready to move on? All right, good. All right, uh, so this is the line in the sand, okay? So everybody get this spectrum in their head and get this line in the middle. So to the left of this, these are field defects, generally increased risk, not pre-malignant lesions. So again, we'll just cover quickly what we do. High-risk lesions that are not ATP or LCIS, excisional biopsy, maybe observation. The, a, the atypia and LCIS, excisional biopsy plus risk reduction therapy, risk reduction therapy, get that in your head. And then everything to the right of this, we're gonna talk about true pre-malignant or malignant lesions. So now we're gonna add some things to the treatment treatment paradigm, okay? So how do we treat DCIS, uh, Meg? This is intern level, this should be pretty easy. So for DCIS, I would do a um, lumpectomy but if okay. my patient um, had like, was positive for genetics or um, wanted a mastectomy, then um, you would want to do sentinel lymph node biopsy as well. Okay, good. If you're, I like that. If, if you're just doing the lumpectomy, 
um, then you don't have to do the sentinel lymph node at the time of the lumpectomy. You can wait and see if the pathology comes back as um, actually having invasive components. And then if they do have invasive components, then you need to go back and do the sentinel node. Okay, good. So you do your lumpectomy and what else do they need? Um, so then you would also do like risk reduction therapy. So if they're ERPR positive, you talk about hormonal treatments. And then, oh, sorry, for the lumpectomy, they also need whole breast radiation. Good, yeah. So again, let's draw this line in the sand. Let's not call this risk, risk reduction anymore. This is a pre-malignant lesion. You are treating the lesion. You're not treating their overall risk. So they need lumpectomy plus radiation or mastectomy. Those two options are should be sort of equivalent in your mind. And this is gonna be true of invasive cancer too. Lumpectomy plus radiation or mastectomy. Those are the two options for treating the breast. And then uh, you're gonna offer uh, adjuvant therapy essentially. So you're gonna treat their whole body for risk of development of cancer. So this is kind of how I, and I, those of you that have counseled patients with me, I always use this picture. And I talk about, there are three ways that we stage cancer and three ways that we treat cancer. So there's the TNM, which is, I think, an easy framework. There's the tumor, the nodes, and the rest of the body. So we need to think about how we're going to treat the tumor, how we're going to treat the nodes, how we're going to treat the rest of the body. So the tumor, how are we going to treat the breast? It's either going to be a mastectomy or it's going to be lumpectomy plus radiation. Those two are equivalent. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to treat the nodes. Like Meg said, in DCIS, we don't worry about the nodes. It, DCIS, by definition, is not invasive, so it can't go to the nodes unless you're wrong, and then you do your lumpectomy and it comes back on an invasive component, then you go back into your sentinel node. The only time you definitely need to do a sentinel node for DCIS is if you take the whole breast, if you do a mastectomy, because you lose your chance to do the sentinel node. That's your only chance to do it. And then we'll talk about how we treat the whole body. So that's going to be systemic therapy, okay? And in the case of DCIS, that's not going to be chemo. It's going to be hormonal therapy. All right, so how do we treat the breast? So this is my kind of algorithm for DCIS. So uh, DCIS, we're going to do either lumpectomy and radiation or mastectomy. And then whichever option we get, it doesn't matter, we're going to go down to adjuvant therapy at the end. Okay, so again, breast, nodes, whole body. Okay, that's the framework that I use to think about breast cancer, whether DCIS or invasive. We'll go through each one of these and the data behind them. Okay, so why do we need to treat DCIS with radiation. Why can't we just do a lumpectomy? Anybody know what the data behind that is? Thinking like chief level. Are there any chiefs even on at this point? Maybe Phil knows because he's Phil. Who else? Um, Kai's the only chief, but she told me her computer is broken and she probably doesn't know anyway. So. Bobby, don't you're, you're don't green. talk to her like that, you know please. Uh, you you reduce um, the rate of like ipsilateral breast events by twelve percent or something, ten percent. Way more than that. So I guess it depends if you're talking about absolute risk or relative risk, right? So, but let's talk about relative risk because that's what most Ab patients want to know. Absolute. I think, what I think do you think the relative risk reduction is? 50. Yeah, good. So 50%. So, okay. So NSABP B17. So this is a big landmark trial on this. Again, one of the things that's good about breast cancer is that we have these big landmark trials, but we actually know some things. Um, all right. So big trial, 818 women with DCIS randomized to lumpectomy or lumpectomy plus radiation. Simple trial, big trial, answers questions. 15 year cumulative risk of uh, of this is just invasive cancer. Lumpectomy alone, 19.4%. Lumpectomy plus radiation, 8.9%. So basically cut the risk in half, 52%. So uh, this is non-invasive, this is invasive. So this is at 12 years. Uh, there are, you know, these, these studies get published over and over. So the 15 year, and this is only 12 years, so this is from two different papers, not to confuse you, but just to give you an idea of the curves, you're basically cutting the risk in half at every different at every different point. So lumpectomy plus radiation, the radiation component reduces the risk by half. 
That's for both invasive and non-invasive, okay? 50% easy number to remember. Basically what uh, P1 showed and what B17 showed, 50% risk, 50% risk. So keep that number in mind. All right, who can get accelerated partial breast radiation? This is a little more advanced. You probably don't need to know this to be perfectly, perfectly honest, but I just wanted to cover it. So per the NCCN guidelines, these are the people that can get accelerated partial breast radiation. So it has to be screen detected. So check any idea what that means, screen detected, why does that matter? It means you don't feel a lump. This is just found purely on imaging. Yeah, exactly. So in for those of you who are senior residents and getting ready to take the boards and things like that, you should separate screen detected DCIS and, and mass associated DCIS in your mind. Mass associated DCIS has a much higher risk of being upstaged on lumpectomy. And so that one of the rare circumstances where you might do a sentinel node for DCIS is a mass associated DCIS in the tail of the breast where you think there's a high risk of it being upstaged to invasive cancer. And because it's in the tail, you're worried about disrupting the lymphatics. So those are the cases, mass associated DCIS gets treated a little bit more like invasive cancer although I still wouldn't do a sentinel node if it was away from the lymphatics and not in the tail, because you know you can always do it when you come back. But mass associated DCIS, it's not common, but it's treated a little bit different because you just suspect that they probably missed the, the invasive component when they did the biopsy. So it has to be screen detected, grade one or two, so can't be high grade, less than 2.5 centimeters and greater than the three millimeter margin. So those are the pay that this is also changing i will tell you this is what the current guidelines say but it'll probably change let's talk about quickly the trials so this is based off well, this trial which looked at those criteria so those criteria were basically created by this trial so screen detected dcis that should be grade one or two not grade one half uh and then greater than a three millimeter margin and i think i didn't write it down but they also wanted the tumor to be less than 2.5 centimeters so Small tumors with a decent margin and low grade, they looked at radiation doses of 50.4 and 42.5. It's not overly important what the doses are, but basically they did standard radiation where people have to come in for five weeks versus a more accelerated radiation dose, a smaller dose over shorter time. The couple interesting things in this trial, one, the initial suspicion was maybe the radiation won't matter at all, but it did matter. This was at eight years. So the local failure, failure rate was 7% versus 1%. So radiation did matter even for these low risk lesions. And then basically, but sorry, the radiation did matter for local failure, but there was no difference in overall survival. And that's gonna be a theme of all breast cancer trials is that everything that we do probably doesn't change overall survival because these women are followed closely and when they recur, we can treat them. So it's very hard to show a difference in overall survival or especially for something like DCIS, right? So you're almost never gonna see a difference in overall survival. But we use the local failure rate to determine our quote unquote failure. So local failure rate seven versus one, uh, and there was no difference based on the radiation dose. So this was a trial from like 10 years ago that said maybe we can do a lower dose of radiation for low grade or for low risk DCIS. And then more recently, this trial just came out a few months ago called the RAPID trial. They took women with either DCI 40 years or older with DCIS or small invasive cancers that were node negative. So you can basically think of this as a, uh, a T1, it wasn't exactly T1, but a T1N0 breast cancer or DCIS. And they looked at uh, accelerated radiation, meaning a lower dose over less. So they actually came in twice a day for five days and then they were done versus standard radiation, which the standard that we often think of is 50 gray over 25 fractions. So what that translates into you for the junior residents, don't memorize the doses, but it's five days a week for five weeks, five days a week for five weeks. And when you counsel a patient about lumpectomy versus mastectomy, you have to include that with the lumpectomy, right? So it's lumpectomy, but you gotta come in every day for five weeks to get radiation. So don't forget that part. But this trial looked at, can we get all that radiation done in one week? And the answer was 2000 women, eight year rate, basically yes is the answer. So we can give accelerated partial breast radiation and there's no increased risk of recurrence for low grade, or I'm sorry, for low risk breast cancer or for DCIS, okay? So accelerated partial breast radiation is probably gonna become more common because of this trial. 
What are the downsides of accelerated partial breast radiation? Any idea? Sheckman, Bobby, Beth, Christina, anybody? Anybody want to go hot? Skin change with the increased dosing over a shorter period of time. Okay, yeah, so basically cosmetic effects. So short-term toxicity was actually lower with uh, accelerated radiation, accelerated partial breast radiation, but late toxicity and cosmesis was worse. So uh, absolute difference of 17.7% of the patient's subjective, uh, you know, their, um, their perception of their cosmesis at seven years. So. That is one issue, is that if you have a young woman who is going to be very worried about cosmesis, it might be worth doing standard radiation as, ex as opposed to accelerated. But again, an older woman who is not as worried about, radi about their cosmesis, you know, accelerated partial breast radiation might be a good option if they only want to come in for five days and they, you know, they're not too worried about their cosmesis. So just keep in mind that this is kind of where uh, the radiation field is going for DCIS and low-risk breast cancers is moving more towards accelerated uh, partial breast because it's sort of painful to come in every day for five weeks, okay? All right, so who doesn't need radiation at all? I don't want to show you the answer, but uh, Sheckman, any ideas? I'm going to hide the answer somehow. Who doesn't need radiation at all? So generally, uh, women over 70, um, people that have uh, like very like low grade, so grade one uh, or grade two DCIS, uh, generally it's over 70 and low grade, sorry. Um, okay, anything else? And then if you do oncotyping on it, uh, people with the genomic index is low, I may not benefit from. No, no. Scratch, scratch that. Everybody forget that he just said that. Strike that from the record. Oncotype <laughs> has to do with chemo. Oncotype okay. has to do with chemo, not radiation. So oncotype has nothing to do with radiation. Okay. Now you, there is a, there are like studies on an oncotype Sorry. for DCIS, and okay. you know you may, that has been looked at, but I would not, for your your guys level, I would not confuse oncotype with radiation. Okay. So again, oncotype is more about treating the whole body, not about treating the breast. We're talking about treating the breast right now. Okay. So, but yeah, you're right. 70 and low risk. So one thing that makes you low risk is the grade. What's the other thing that makes breast cancer low risk and offers you another adjuvant therapy? So receptor status. Yeah, exactly. ER positive. Good. So greater than 70 screen detected, grade one or two. These are size components. And then ER positive should be on that list. Sorry. So what is this based off of? It's not actually based off of a DCIS study. It's based off of a um, it's based off of an invasive cancer study. So CalGB9343 big trial, um, simple question sort of. So over 70 T1 N0 cancer that's ER positive. Do these patients need radiation? And why would they not re need radiation, Checkman? Because they're lifetime like yeah the chance of them developing another cancer is low. Can right. I ask one so more those, question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so when I was reading about radiotherapy last night, they kept talking about like genomic index, predicting who would benefit from radiation therapy, just ignore that. So you're talking about for DCIS? Yeah. Yeah, so Oncotype is not for DCIS. Oncotype yes. is for okay. invasive cancer, but yeah. So there are people looking at, can we, can we, figure out which DCIS patients don't need radiation and maybe don't need any therapy at all. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but okay. for standard kind of down the line treatment, this is, these are the patients that you can omit radiation. There are sure. people definitely talking about there is a group of low risk DCIS that doesn't actually need radiation, maybe doesn't need any surgery at all. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a big trial looking at that. So we'll talk about that. But for standard down the line treatment, who doesn't need radiation? Again, over 70. These are invasive cancers, T1, but DCIS would be the same thing, and ER positive. So basically what they showed is uh, this is adjuvant treatment with just tamoxifen or tamoxifen and radiation. And what they showed is, yes, there is local regional recurrence in the women that don't get radiation. But this is, again, on the 10 to 15-year time scale where it starts to really separate. 
And what they found was distant disease-free survival, no difference at all, okay? So did these women develop distant METs? No. And then was there any change in overall survival? No, okay? So the overall survival is essentially the exact same. And while I want you to notice this curve, so the slant of this curve is pretty dramatic. And that's overall survival. Why do you think that slant is so dramatic? Because there are over 70 of other medical problems, right? So at 15 years, now this cohort of women is 85 and their overall survival is only 25%. So 75% of them are gonna die of something else during those 15 years. So this little bit of local recurrence difference is not gonna make a difference for them. So again, this, is, this comes back to like, you gotta think about every patient a little differently. And if they have a 15 year mortality that's pretty high, then they probably don't need to reduce their risk of breast cancer local recurrence by 50%. It just doesn't make a difference for them, okay? So that's radiation for DCIS. Who needs a mastectomy? We kind of already covered this, but one thing we didn't talk about is evidence of widespread disease on imaging, physical exam or biopsy. So if, if they have microcalcs throughout their breast and you're like, there's no way I'm getting a negative margin on that, that might be the patient that gets a mastectomy up front. And I know, I think on one of your oral board questions this year, uh, there was a pregnant patient with DCIS. So the pregnant patient with DCIS, you can offer mastectomy or you can do a lumpectomy and then just delay their radiation until after they give birth. But lump, mastectomy is one option for pregnant patients with DCIS. The, uh, the more common reason that you would do a mastectomy is if they have microcalcs throughout their whole breast and you biopsy two or three spots in that breast and all those microcalcs are DCIS then you're probably gonna have trouble getting a positive or a negative margin. The other option, the other time would be if you go to the OR twice and you get positive margins twice, I would probably offer a mastectomy at that point, unless you know they had very large breasts and you still thought you could get it done with lumpectomy. But once you get multiple positive margins, you have to start thinking about mastectomy. So we talked about this sentinel node biopsy should be strongly considered uh, if mastectomy is done because you'll lose your chance to do sentinel node, and if 20% of them come back with invasive cancer, you're going to feel bad because then your options are watch them with ultrasound or do an axe dissection, and it's kind of this, you're outside the guidelines at that point. So anytime you do mastectomy, do a sentinel node. That's the easy answer. Okay. Final thing on local therapy for DCIS, what margins do we need? Beth. Um, for DCIS? Yes. Um, I've read one centimeter, but it was kind of inconsistent okay. actually when I was reading yesterday. I know that for invasive okay, cancer, it's uh, no tumor, I think, but I actually think you need bigger. Good. Yeah, so it's confusing, but yes, you need a wider margin for DCIS than invasive. Anybody know the number? Two millimeters. All right, it's two millimeters. I got to keep, I got to move on. You got to move along a little bit here. Sorry. So the guidelines say two millimeters, and this has created a lot of consternation and confusion, rightfully so, in my opinion. So a few years ago, yeah, 2016, the combined SSO, ASTRO, ASCO guidelines. So this is like the big radiology, big surgery, big medicine, oncology groups all got together, wrote these guidelines on DCIS. They said at least two millimeter margin in patients treated with radiation is associated with lower rates of ipsilateral uh, tumor recurrence. So they recommended a two millimeter margin, although they gave this caveat of every case should be considered, you know, you know, you should consider every case its own case. So things to consider, presence of resi residual calcifications after you do your lumpectomy, probably take a wider margin. Uh, which margin is close. So if it's a skin margin or the deep margin, you probably don't need to go back. And then the life expectancy of the patient. So again, if their 15-year risk of dying of something else is high, then you probably don't need to worry about their in-breast uh, recurrence rate. This was based on one trial, which was a meta-analysis of, well, I shouldn't say it was based on one trial, but the big trial they pointed to was a meta-analysis of a bunch of patients. Uh, and what they found was, if you did, if you looked at negative versus positive margins, there was a dramatic increased risk of recurrence. If you looked at less than two millimeters versus two millimeters, there was also a pretty dramatic increased risk of recurrence. And then if you looked at two versus five, there was no difference. So they said, uh, you definitely need a negative margin. Two millimeters seems to be better than uh, less than two millimeters. And then uh, beyond two, it doesn't matter. 
And this was all patients that got radiation. Now there have been two big papers published since that that have kind of contradicted this. So this is from Memorial. They looked at 3,000 cases. Uh, and basically what they showed is in the entire population, these lines here represent different margin widths. So the top one is greater than 10 and then two to 10 and then less than two and then margin positive. So clearly margin positive does worse than everybody else, um, but the rest are pretty close together. So the effect of radiation on the importance of margins. So what I'm trying to show here is the entire population, margins probably matter a little bit. If we look at just women who got radiated, uh, or I'm sorry, just women who did not get radiated, you can see that the curves separate very nicely. So if you're not gonna radiate a patient, their risk of recurrence has a lot to do with your margin. So the wider margin, the better if you don't give radiation. But when they looked at just women who got radiation, there was no difference, p-value 0.99. So again, the black line is a positive margin, so that's probably not great. You shouldn't leave a positive margin. But the different widths of margin that they looked at, there was no difference between the three. So this argues against that guideline and says, if you're gonna radiate the patient, it doesn't really matter what margin you get. So the guidelines have not caught up with this. Um, and then, so again, margin greater than two millimeters, probably only if you're not gonna give radiation, according to this paper. The interesting thing about this is that, and Rob could probably talk to this, the senior author on this, Monica Morrow, was the first author on those guidelines that said a two millimeter margin is needed. So it's sort of, an interesting, I don't know what uh, what happened there, but the same person argued for two different things across this paper versus their big guidelines. And then this is the MD Anderson experience. Uh, hold on, this, sorry, that should be MD Anderson. So this is the MD Anderson paper, which basically shows the same thing. So this is less than two millimeters. Um, the RT group did better than, uh, or I'm sorry, this is still the memorial paper. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hurry here. So this is the memorial paper. What the, the question this asks is, does radiation matter if you get a small margin or a big margin? If you get a small margin, margin less than or equal to two millimeters, radiation mattered a lot. If you get a big margin, so you get a one centimeter margin around that DCIS, radiation still matters. The p-value is still significant, but the relative risk reduction is more like 30% than 50%. And you can see the curves are pretty darn close together. So the wider margin you get, the less radiation matters. So if you have a, like I had a patient recently who was 65, really didn't want to get radiation. And so I did a very big lumpectomy on her, planning to get a wide margin. She had a, a very small focus, like a five millimeter focus of DCIS. I got a one centimeter margin. We did not give her radiation because you know, her risk of in-breast recurrence is probably a little bit higher, but does it really matter for her with you know, a small focus of low grade DCIS? So I felt comfortable with her not getting radiation based on some of this data. All right, so uh, radiation still matters with wide margin, but less so, okay? So it's less important. All right, so this is the MD Anderson paper. Basically, it shows the same thing. So this is all patients, patients who got radiation, patients who didn't get radiation. All patients didn't matter. It was close, but it didn't matter. Radiation patients made no difference at all, whether or not, you, this is basically greater than two or less than two millimeter. So that two millimeter margin thing does not seem to matter in patients who get radiation. It does seem to matter in patients who don't get radiation. Now, granted, this is based on very small numbers, but. If you're not gonna give radiation, you need to get a wider margin. If you are gonna give radiation, you probably don't need that larger than two millimeter margin. But I will say that it's very confusing right now because the guidelines still say greater than two. Okay, so lumpectomy with two millimeter margins, that's gonna be your board answer. I put a question mark after it because I don't really know that it makes that much difference. All right, so how do we treat the whole body? That's gonna be the last question we answer here. So how are we gonna treat the whole body for these patients? Adjuvant therapy with hormonal therapy. We've talked about this a little bit already, okay? So this is based on the NSABB B24 trial. So this trial looked at the impact of tamoxifen in DCIS patients with lumpectomy and radiation. So all these women got lumpectomy and radiation. The question is adding tamoxifen to that therapy, did it matter? So it's a big trial, 1,800 patients, uh, you know, 900 in each arm. So the bottom line is it reduced uh, local recurrence by 32 percent 
So about a third uh, of, uh, a, they reduce the risk by about a third. So that's less than radiation, but still significant. The interesting part is that it increased risk across both breasts. So, uh, yeah, okay, so here are the KMs. So this is, hold on, sorry, I don't want to go to this yet. I apologize. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of things real quick. Um, am I? Damn it. All right, let me go back. I'm not going to talk about the other breasts just yet. So this is for DCIS, tamoxifen for DCIS. It, it decreases the risk. The reality is, and Beth, you kind of brought this up earlier. So now we're starting to talk about ER positive and non-ER positive. So who's it going to work better for? The ER positive women, obviously, right? So this is an analysis of the of the B24 population who had tissue that was stained for ER receptors. So this trial was done before we stained everybody for ER receptors. So we didn't have that information on all 1,800 patients, but these 700 women, we did have that information. And it, what these KMs represent is the top one is women who were ER negative. The bottom one is women who are ER positive. And you see that all the benefit is in the ER positive group. So for ER negative women with DCIS, tamoxifen does not help. For ER positive women with DCIS, it does help. Okay, make sense? Everybody following me? Okay. All right, so in ER negative women, no difference. ER positive women, 42% relative risk reduction. So a higher than the 30% uh, in the general population. If you look just at ER positive women, it was a 42% relative risk reduction. So it works not only works, but it works better uh, than the general population, which makes sense. Okay, so this is a paper that was published looking at B17 and B24, so I should say B24. So this looked at the two big DCIS trials. It looked at the radiation trial and the tamoxifen trial, combined all the data into one, and then drew out some nice GAN. So these are the findings. Radiation reduced recurrence by 52% compared to lumpectomy alone. We talked about that. Adding tamoxifen, reduce the risk by another 32%. Uh, so ipsilateral recurrence, 19 versus eight, uh, 10 versus 8.5. So if you get all three treatments, your risk is like 8% of an ipsilateral recurrence at 15 years, so that's long-term. So these are the long the long-term curves. So this top line is women who got lumpectomy alone. So obviously that rate of recurrence is very high, but again, this is 15, 20 years. So if you're only gonna live five years, then it's probably not a big deal. If you're going to live 20 years because you're only 50, then it's a big deal that you get all these therapies. This is DCIS and this is invasive. Um, and then this is the curve for the contralateral side. So these two curves are ipsilateral. So this is the, the risk of ipsilateral recurrence. So clearly lumpectomy alone is bad, but the reality is that tamoxifen doesn't add that much for the ipsilateral side. Tamoxifen really helps on the contralateral side where you're not getting radiation and you're still at risk for recurrence because you have a history of DCIS. So this is the, the curve for contralateral. So the lumpectomy, lumpectomy plus radiation uh, and lumpectomy plus radiation without tamoxifen, basically those two arms are the same, but the lumpectomy and lumpectomy plus radiation get all clumped together on the contralateral side. And the only curve that separates on the contralateral side is the one that got tamoxifen. So the hormonal therapy is treating the whole body, not just the single breast, whereas the lumpectomy and radiation are just treating the single breast. That makes sense to everybody? So when you talk about contralateral risk, you gotta give hormonal therapy. Okay, ATAC trial looked at tamoxifen versus an AI. Can somebody tell me what the findings were? Sheckman maybe, Bobby maybe? You can guess, you're gonna guess right. Uh, which one's better? They're the same. If it's uh, if they're postmenopausal, AI is adequate. Uh, if they're not, uh, if they're premenopausal, tamoxifen. It's actually even better than that. So this is 6,000 postmenopausal women with early stage breast cancer, anastrozole versus tamoxifen. Anastrozole actually did better. So anastrozole actually works better if you're postmenopausal than tamoxifen. So we never use tamoxifen anymore for postmenopausal women in any situation because of this trial. Um, I shouldn't say never, but almost never. Uh, so again, not a huge difference, but a 13% absolute risk reduction. Uh, and then there were also less treatment uh, related adverse events. So there's less thromboembolic events and less endometrial cancer with an AI than with tamoxifen. So 
when we kind of break this all down, so DCIS, our options are lumpectomy with a two millimeter margin plus radiation, one of these three types of radiation or, or one of these two types of radiation or no radiation if they're older. Um, and then there are some subtleties to that but I don't want you to worry too much about that. The other option, if they're not gonna get a lumpectomy and radiation, is mastectomy. So a young woman who absolutely refuses radiation for whatever reason, needs a mastectomy. If you're gonna do a mastectomy, do a sentinel node. All these women should be thinking about adjuvant therapy if they're ER positive. They get tamoxifen if they're premenopausal, AI if they're postmenopausal. If they're ER negative, there is no adjuvant therapy, okay? Questions about any of that? That's sort of an in-depth look at DCIS. So if you know all that stuff, you know everything you need to know about DCIS. Any questions at all? Nothing at all. All right, I think that's all I have. I just wanted to summarize again. Oh wait, sorry. The Comet trial, the Comet trial. I just wanted to briefly mention the Comet trial. And this is kind of alludes to what Checkman was talking about. Most people think that we're over-treating uh, early-stage DCIS. And part of the reason is that, again, when you look at the overall survival curves for these women, DCIS rarely affects overall survival because if they're followed reasonably and they pop back up with invasive cancer, then you treat that invasive cancer. They don't die of it. So it's very unusual for these women to present with a widely metastatic tumor or something like that. So we're using in-breast tumor recurrence as our endpoint but is that really the uh, the right endpoint? I mean, just depends who you talk to. And But I think most women, I will say, err on the side of not wanting to have uh, even a local breast cancer, which makes sense, you know? And again, the morbidity of a breast surgery is not the morbidity of a Whipple. And so with lower morbidity, you're gonna be more aggressive surgically. So this trial is looking at active surveillance versus what they call guideline concordant care. Essentially, that means lumpectomy and radiation and tamoxifen versus tamoxifen alone with Q6 month imaging. So active surveillance is endocrine therapy with mammogram every six months for five years. The other arm, standard of care arm, is surgery plus radiation and endocrine therapy with every 12 month mammogram for five years. Inclusion criteria, you have to be over 40. The inclusion criteria are actually pretty broad for this. So you have to be over 40, grade one or two, so you can't have high grade DCIS. No microinvasion, but that's obvious. ER positive, so they have to be ER positive. That makes sense. And then some people do HER2 testing on DCIS. We don't, but they can't be HER2 over uh, amplified to be in this trial. Primary outcome, I don't love this outcome. It's invasive cancer at two years, which I think is way too short because not that many women develop invasive cancer at two years from DCIS. So, you know, this will probably be one of these trials where they're going to report the two-year outcome, and then they'll report the five-year outcome, 10-year outcome, 15-year outcome. But this may change the way that we treat DCIS in the future. So if it turns out that women with grade one ER positive DCIS uh, don't develop, you know, if they just get tamoxifen alone and they don't develop a lot of cancers at 10 years, we may stop doing surgery on DCIS, especially for older patients. Because again, if you're 70, uh, and your more your 15 year mortality is 75 percent, uh, and you're you know all we're talking about is a five percent, 10 percent in breast tumor recurrence. Then why are we doing surgery at all? So this this is just keep in mind that this one is out there and being done, uh, and uh, may change the way we manage DCIS. Uh, okay. Comet trial, keep that one in mind. All right, so here's our spectrum again, right? Draw a line in your head right here. This is pre-malignant, I'm sorry, field defect, not pre-malignant, and then pre-malignant, malignant. malignant. High-risk lesions, we're gonna do excisional biopsy on the test we might observe in real life. Uh, the a atypia or LCIS, we're gonna do an excisional biopsy. We don't care about margins, but we are gonna offer risk reduction therapy, which could come in the form of hormonal therapy or additional surgery. And then after we get over this line, we have to start thinking about radiating the breast. So DCIS does get radiation on your boards, except in rare circumstances. Um, and then we still offer hormonal therapy for ER positive. And then stay tuned for next week when we talk about invasive cancer. And these are the trials that I would at least be aware of. P1 for the prevention of uh, development of cancer in the high-risk lesions. 17 and 24, 17 is radiation, 24 is hormonal therapy, 
you probably don't need to know that one, but that was the uh, the older patient drop. All right, questions about anything at all? Will I send the PowerPoint? I will send the PowerPoint. All right, let's let's stop recording if we're gonna do M and M. Okay. Um, I don't have to listen. For